I've just started to read this novel, and the best way to describe it is, oh god! <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today to talk about a literary abomination. Now, you may have noticed sometimes when you watch my videos, I got all these books back here. Magic the Gathering has been making novels since almost the beginning. Now, admittedly, the first number of novels didn't tie into the actual story of what was going on in any particular set. They were just kind of individual, like, here, let's do something in the vein of Magic the Gathering, but they weren't specific. As time progressed, they started to create novels that were tied into particular blocks. You know, okay, here's the book for Scourge. Here's the book for Betrayers of Kamigawa. And they'll be included with the fat packs, give you the story of what's going on in the world. You could pick some of it up from the cards, but to get to the real meat of it, you dive into a book, right? That's what you would do. Now, Wizards of the Coast abandoned the concept of novels for about a decade now. And they decided that for War of the Spark, what they were going to do was bring the whole story concept back. And I was really, really excited. I was super on board. Honestly, I couldn't wait to get the book. I was super happy that they were choosing to do the pre-release season broken up into like different storyline chunks and told chronologically because I am a massive fan of flavor and lore. So when I was asked by a very kind fan if I wanted a copy of this book, I said yes, and he went the extra mile and got me the hardcover. And I genuinely feel bad about him wasting his money. The original plan, the original plan was for me to read as much of this book as I could during the pre-release weekend. I was going to sit down and read a whole bunch of it, and we'd be able to summarize a nice chunk of the book. Do you know how far I made it into this book before I had to put it down out of disgust? I read the prologue and the first chapter. And the first cha the chapters in this book are like three pages. So I read about six or seven pages of this book and I wanted to die. I wanted to die. I'm going to read, I'm going to read the first paragraph of the first chapter. Not, not the prelude, not the prologue, but the first chapter. Just, just to give you a taste of what we're dealing with, okay? And then we'll back up and we'll talk about the prologue. So, the first, the first paragraph goes like this. And it's, it's about Teo Varada, in case you didn't know. He is a new character specifically created for the novel War of the Spark here. So, his, his pack heavy on his shoulders. Teo Varada trudged through the sands beneath his world's twin sons, along the edge of the dune, trying to ignore the farting carry beast in front of him as he daydreamed of the miracle dot 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 of the lavatory. Of the lavatory. For those of you who don't know, that's a toilet. That's how this book starts. We have the main character worrying about animals farting in his face and talking about toilets, okay? That, that sets the tone for what this novel will be. Now the first, the first, the, the technical first chapter, the prologue, the prelude, whatever you want to call it, the lead-in, is abysmal. It focuses around Ugin and Niv-Mizzet talking. Of course, they don't name drop Niv-Mizzet's name until the end of the end of the chapter, all three or four pages of it. So we know what happens in the story at this point. Obviously, there's going to be spoilers in this video if you're not 100% up to speed, but Nicol Bolas destroys Niv-Mizzet. Niv-Mizzet ends up getting destroyed, and we know he gets destroyed because he ends up reborn, he ends up taking on the Guild Pact, all that happens in the future. But he gets destroyed by Nicol Bolas. Now, what is that part of the novel like? I don't know, because they didn't include it. Oh, why bother putting in a pivotal and most likely interesting moment of the story where even if it had been brief, even if it had just been Nicol Bolas just waving away Niv-Mizzet like he's nothing. Niv-Mizzet's been alive for like 15,000 years. Niv-Mizzet's been around since the beginning of Ravnica, one of the originators of the Guild Pact, and he just gets taken down by Nicol Bolas. Even if he was just slapped down by Nicol Bolas immediately, it would have been very very interesting to read that. That would have been cool. But no, we don't get that. We get a conversation between Ugin 
And Niv Mizzet's already dead. He's already trapped himself in some kind of spirit box that they briefly touch on where he's like, I kind of took the information from an Orzov brain. It's just, it's insane to me. This genuinely reads as if huge portions were already told. This is like book two. This is like book two in a three book series, honestly. that That's how the beginning comes across. I'm like, literally like, is there, is, is there something I should know know already? What what's the deal? What what is going on here? Why would they do it this way? And they have ridiculous lines in here where Ugin's talking up Nicol Bolas and talking about how he has absolutely no faith in anyone else. Then why did he not see Liliana betrayal coming? If he has such staggering confidence in himself and no belief in anybody else, why would he possibly possibly allow someone to take over his army without ability to take control back? This is just setting the stage for the idiocy that's going to come along. But admittedly, that 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 chapter wasn't as bad as the Teo Verata chapter. I'm not I'm not even joking. So the first paragraph that I read to you is about toilets and farting. The second paragraph is talking about them staying at a um them staying in an inn, okay? Teo is a shield mage. They're staying at an inn and shield mages are revered on this plane because of their protective capabilities. So they're all going to be treated to actually staying in proper rooms instead of the stable. It also lets us know that Teo's 19, a 19 year old boy, boy, I'm calling him a boy, who's obsessed with farting and toilets. That that's So the second paragraph is just talking about their lodging. Do you know what the third paragraph's talking about? You guessed it, farting and toilets again. In the third paragraph, that's what it's about. There's a huge, there's a huge, Chunk, I want you to understand something. Nothing is done to describe Teo in any way. Nothing is done to describe what he looks like, any of that. But when it goes back to the, the it, where there wasn't the real wonder of the place, there was no chamber pots, no latrines, no wash basins that required filling from a jug, which required filling from a pump 100 yards away. Water was piped right into a small lavatory down the hall for drinking, washing, bathing, and well waste. And that said waste was then piped away somehow to somewhere that just wasn't outside your window, causing a stink worse than the carry beast gases. It was kind of a miracle to Teo, and his mind just couldn't let it go. His mind couldn't let it go. Three paragraphs, two of them about farting, and toilets and the next paragraph oh we get a little bit more of we get to know the name of the plane he's on this is an entirely different plane of existence by the way one we've never been to that we get like no no view into except for the, the most minor part just talking about the fact that there are shield mages from there so the fourth paragraph talks about that the the fifth and sixth paragraph would you like to guess what they talk about would you like to guess yep farting in toilets again <laughs> He's like, what What did they call that? Is it called plumbing? I don't know what running water has to do with plums, but I always liked plums. That's, that's what this book is. I swear to God, the only interesting part at the beginning at all is talking about the, the geometry-based magic, where they build their shields based on, you're supposed to build diamond-shaped shields with four points, but Teo can't do it because he's inept. So he just makes three-pointed triangle shields and overlaps them. And it talks about the other ones, the other the other acolytes that are with him kind of doing a better job and how he's absolutely just terrible at it. So we get a little bit of that, which is kind of cool because there's a diamond storm whipping up. And this is a cool aspect of the plane. They have diamond storms. And it goes on to describe the increasing intensity of the size of the diamonds. At first, Teo isn't able to shield his pack beast, right? He's he's putting up a shield, but the pack beast is getting just tiny little bits of diamond already starting to rip at its skin. And it starts to talk about how they move up to like the size of marbles and then up to the size of apples. There's like a scale of increasing size of these diamond chunks. And that's pretty amazing. I mean, think about a hailstorm, but made out of diamond, essentially, coming just whipping down at you. That would be very, very dangerous. And you can see why shield mages would be revered. Again, we get no description of Teo, what his character is like. We, have, we don't get to see what anybody looks like, hear about any of that at all. But there is an absurd amount of time focusing on toilets and farting. This book so far reads like it was written for like a 10 year old to giggle over. 
there is what feels like there's going to be no character development. I, I, I basically at the pre-release after I read the first chapter, I just closed the book and groaned. Actually, I did that after I read the first paragraph. Then I went back and went through the first full chapter, trying to find anything that made me feel like okay, I can continue to read this book. So the diamond storms and that magic was interesting. In the in the midst of the storm, it starts to get more intense. Teo can't protect himself properly. He starts actually getting sucked down into the sand. He starts to gasp in sand because he can't breathe. You know, if you were underwater for a while, you would just like, and all of a sudden inhale water. Well, that happens to him. He's inhaling sand. At the same time, white lights are taking over from him, and that is when his spark ignites. Normally, when you're under threat, under duress, when your life is in danger, that's when your spark ignites. So Teo's spark ignites, and he travels off. And that's how that that's how that chapter ends. That three, it's the chapter is three pages long. And at least a full page of that is just toilets and farting. And before I sat down to do this video, I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to take a peek into the next chapter. And I did. I read a few paragraphs in the next chapter. They introduce like 12 characters at breakneck speed. It's like Chandra was laying around having some hot chocolate. And then guess who was there? Jace was there. And Karn was there. And Lionheaded Ajani was there. And that's it. Lionheaded Ajani is the most descriptive I've seen them be about any character. This is the worst trash that I have read so far. I'm barely into the book. I've seen other people's reviews to a degree of this, just talking about points in this book. This thing is going to be a nightmare. Apparently there are 25 short stories that we're supposed to have read before this. Honestly, Wizards of the Coast botched this horrifically to the point where you gain way more information from the card set. The way it used to work was you would have the cards and they would give you a tiny little clue as to what was going on and the book would fill in the details. But that's not what's going on here. No, what's going on here? Farts and toilets, okay? What is the deal? You there, boy. Well, now what do you want? You seem stressed. Would you like to see some real magic, boy? Yeah, fine, let's, let's go. Show me. All right, boy, stand back. This magic is very potent. The most potent magic in all the multiverse. Prepare yourself to be astounded. Witness, witness the majesty. Witness the power and the splendor. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. You weren't ready for this, were you, boy? Oh, roll the golden scroll. Curtain and toilets, good God. <laughs> 